best known for rooting herself firmly in the genres of 80s pop, dance and disco, by the mid to late 90s, Kylie Minogue was reinventing herself as an indie recording artist, attempting to distance herself from her earlier bubblegum pop sound and girl next door image. Now, 25 years on, 1997's Impossible Princess is frequently referred to as Kylie's most artistic and credible record and one which continues to divide opinion. Whilst critiqued harshly at the time, retrospective reviews on the material is often more favoured and appreciated. Largely overlooked by the general public, let's take a deep dive into Kylie Minogue's Impossible Princess. When Kylie Minogue left her label PWL in 1992 due to creative differences, she signed a three-album deal with dance label Deconstruction Records a year later. She worked with a diverse group of collaborators to experiment with different sounds, including the British duo Brothers in Rhythm. Their first offering was Kylie's self-titled album in late 1994, which peaked at number three in Australia and number four in the UK. Besides promotional commitments for the album, Kylie expanded her acting career by taking part in several projects. Among them were big budget films Street Fighter and Biodome. Kylie also worked with Australian musician Nick Cave and his band The Bad Seeds on their 1995 single Where the Wild Roses Grow, which peaked at number two in Australia and number 11 in the UK. The song earned three ARIA awards for Best Pop Release, Single and Song of the Year in 1996. And I'm dreaming that you're in love with me. Kylie's friendship with Nick Cave continued over the years. On Cave's advice, Kylie recited the lyrics to her 1987 song, I Should Be So Lucky, as poetry at A Hip Mass, The Super Jam, First International Poetry Day at London's Royal Albert Hall in July 1996. I should be so lucky in love. Thank you. There was a thing called the Poetry Olympics, and it was a weekend of, of poetry recitals. Where was this? At the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. And Nick Cave, lovely Nick Cave, was performing there, and he'd said to me, you know, it's an, it's an open invitation. If, if you want to get up and do something, you're more than welcome. I said, oh, that's very nice, but I have never recited poetry, so... But I'm very much looking forward to coming and see you do your thing. And... Um, he ended up saying, I really think you should do it, and I think you should recite I Should Be So Lucky. And I said, uh, I, I've not been able to say I should be so lucky in many years, so <laughs> I don't think that will work. But, it, cut a long story short, he planted a seed and I kept thinking, what would it be like, you know? And before I knew it, I was out there in track suits and, you know, weekend attire. and. Um, bounded out on stage. Actually, the guy who was on before us was reciting Braille with long white hair, which made me very nervous. I said, Nick, God is on stage. <laughs> <laughs> How do we follow that? Um, anyway, he said that, that Jesus followed God and, and he did okay, so we've got a chance. <laughs> so I pulled out the, the, the lyrics and said, uh, <clears throat> hi. Um, I, well, I didn't expect to be here today, but here I am, and I'm going to recite something that I didn't write. In my imagination. And straight after that, there was, you know, they reacted to it. So from that point, I knew, thank God it's worked, it worked. So I went through, you know, there's no complication. I dream about you all the time. In my mind, a celebration. Blah, 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 blah. No, no, let's stop. And then no, I got, no. to, got to the chorus, which I, I just went up to the chorus and kind of stopped there, but that was the clinch. I says, I should be so lucky. 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 <laughs> I should be so lucky enough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> In 
December, she made a surprise appearance at a Manic Street Preachers concert at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, singing the track Little Baby Nothing. I think it was in 1991 they had asked if I would be available to sing on a song called um, Little Baby Nothing as a duet, which I only found out about last year. <laughs> so they eventually, they had Tracy Lords sing on, on the record. Um, and I can only imagine that because it was at that time, perhaps it went to PWL and I never heard about it. Both 1996 live performances were viewed as the starting point of Kylie's new alter ego, Indie Kylie, a pseudonym that dealt with her transition into more rock and alternative music. Are you getting into these guys because as a career move or because that's what you like? Um, well, in both those cases, they had wanted to work with me, which I mean, I'm eternally flattered by it, so it wasn't a career move or a kind of record company marketing move to say, okay, who will we go and work with? But those offers came and, uh, and I've just been so inspired and, and um, it's been so wonderful yeah. to work with them. Kylie also began a romantic relationship with French photographer Stéphane Sednoy and embarked on a series of trips with him throughout North America, Asia and Australasia to gain inspiration for her upcoming record. Plans for a new album began in mid-1995 after meetings with Brothers in Rhythm had taken place. Kylie's trips with Stéphane, her deconstruction label mates, and also artists such as Björk, Garbage and Tricky inspired the overall sound of the album. Because it was my first time writing, um, writing songs like this, and I didn't know if I could do it or what I would write about or, you know, how you go about it. I just thought, well, I'll try it. And um, certainly didn't think that I would end up doing as much as I did. I thought I might co-write a couple of tracks or whatever, dip my toes in the water. Mm. Um, and as it turns out, I got so into it. We kind of let a lot of it just develop along the way. And mm. the only thing we really knew initially was that I wanted to write and uh, we thought the best place to start was with Bro Brothers in Rhythm. Right. Who did Confide in Me yeah. and other tracks. And um, so I went in with them. I felt very comfortable working with them. And, and we knew we wanted to go through the Confide in Me door mm -hmm. as opposed to other songs we'd done together. And, uh, and then I was interested in working with other people and Dave Ball was suggested. And I love the work of The Grid and yeah. Cell. So that was... I was very happy to go and meet him and ended up doing quite a few tracks with him. This next song, uh, it hasn't been recorded. It was written about three years ago. It's called Free. Kylie began writing lyrics after Stefan and Nick Cave convinced her to take creative control over her next musical project. The track, Free, was among the earliest songs Kylie wrote for the record, with songs such as Cowboy Style and Dreams also being developed in the early recording stages. Kylie would write every track on the upcoming album. In contrast, she co-wrote only one song on her 1994 studio album. From those initial sessions, Brothers in Rhythm would complete five songs with Kylie that ended up on the final track list. Did It Again, Limbo, Dreams, Say Hey and Cowboy Style. Too Far would see Steve Anderson write the piano line on the final version. According to Steve, many ideas on the demos made it onto the finished tracks. Limbo, Too Far, Did It Again and Cowboy Style were released in their original demo form because Kylie felt that the rawness of the tracks worked better than being polished. Deconstruction encouraged Kylie to work with other artists so as to produce enough potential tracks to release as singles. Most of them were suggested to me. I mean, I'd had the previous collaborations with Brothers in Rhythm. Dave Ball was suggested, and what a good suggestion that, that was. Um, I did a couple of tracks with Olive, just because I'd heard their music quite some time ago. I did two good songs with them, but just so happened that other things came before those, um, so they're not on the album. And with Rob Dugan, who I did Jump With, he was another suggestion of mine that I'd heard his music and thought it'd be interesting to work with him. So there's, there's been a bit of both. 
Nick Cave wrote a track for the album based on Kylie's lyrics entitled Soon, but she was disappointed with her recording and scrapped it. By June 1997, the album had been in production for 21 months and Deconstruction were adding the final touches to it before additional recording sessions would see Kylie work with James Dean Bradfield of Manic Street Preachers. The album took nearly two years to record, the longest period Kylie had worked on a musical project at that time. Many changes of direction, remixes and co-writers lengthened the process which at times upset and infuriated Kylie. Steve Anderson explained that this was due to the pure perfectionism of everyone involved. Stefan Sednoui shot the images and designed the cover sleeve for the album, which was inspired by French and Japanese pop culture. Initially, the cover art was based on a string of experimental images of Kylie in geisha costume. The final cover depicts Kylie sitting and surrounded by swirling multicoloured lights, dressed in a blue sleeveless Veronique Leroy mini dress with no title or name imprinted. Because Deconstruction wanted to distribute a limited edition version of the album with a hologram sleeve, Sednoui had to photograph separate artwork for those editions. The three-dimensional lenticular sleeve required multiple static cameras to shoot Kylie in the dark. To create the long exposure effect of the lights circulating around Kylie, Stefan Sednoui had to be fully dressed in a black bodysuit so he could not be seen in the final shot. The shoot took a week to complete and Kylie had to pose for many hours. There's a writer called Billy Childish who is a poet and he had written in the front of one of his books um, a dedication to me and he gave it to a friend who gave it to Nick Cave who gave it to me. So this little book took a journey through different people and finally arrived at me and the book was called Poems to Break the Hearts of Impossible Princesses. And as soon as I saw it, it just registered so heavily with me. Impossible Princess. I just liked the way that it sounded and the way that it, it moved as, as, as a couple of words. And I really liked the book of poetry. And that was given to me basically when I started working on the album. And one of the first songs I wrote was Dreams, based on Impossible Princess which just kind of stayed as we, we had more and more and more songs. It was just hanging around, kind of near the bottom of the pile, but always had something to it. And as it only came back to the forefront, literally, you know, in the last mile of the record, and, uh, and I, I really like the way that there's a story behind the book reaching me as well. It's not something I just saw in the bookstore, but that he had thought to give me one of his books, which is really kind. Kylie wanted to introduce the album in a way that would intrigue and surprise the public. The track Limbo was suggested by Kylie to become the lead single, but the label was concerned that it may lack commercial and radio appeal. Some Kind of Bliss was therefore agreed upon to be the first single release on the 8th of September 1997. David Mould directed the music video shot in the desert of Tabernas in Spain, which also featured Dexter Fletcher as Kylie's lover. Released a week after Princess Diana's death, Some Kind of Bliss was a commercial disappointment. It peaked at number 22 in the UK, becoming Kylie's first single not to reach the top 20. It reached number 27 in Australia, number 46 on the New Zealand singles chart, which was also her last charting release there in the 1990s. It wasn't my choice, but I agreed it was a good choice because I think it's been such a long time since I last had a single. And so it's good to come out with something that's slightly unexpected. Some Kind of Bliss was written by James Dean Bradford and myself, and he, he had a couple of pages of lyrics of mine, or words of mine, and he took half of the song from one set and the other half from another set and put them together, which I found interesting because it's something that I wouldn't have done, um, because in my mind they were two separate things, but they actually do work together, and to me it's about being able to not necessarily shut your eyes and feel that someone's there, but the way that if you're close with someone, whether it's your lover or your best friend or your family or whoever, 
the ability to feel like they're with you when they're actually millions of miles away. That it's very reassuring, and it just it happened to me at one point, and I found myself smiling to myself. September would see the release of GBI, German Bold Italic, Kylie's collaboration with Japanese-American music producer Tower Tay. It was the lead single from Tower Tay's second studio album, Sound Museum. It peaked at number 50 in Australia, but failed to reach the top 50 in the UK, where it peaked at number 63. However, it was said to be a minor hit in Tower Tay's home country, Japan. The song's music video was directed by Stefan Sednoui and inspired by mutual appreciation of Japanese culture between him and Kylie. It features scenes of Kylie dressed as a geisha walking through the streets of New York City. German. Bold. Was it fun oh. making it though? It was really good fun, I have to say. It was um, two days shooting, a few more days of rehearsal. It was very finely tuned with all the choreography and, you know, had to was do a lot of work, but it, it was great. Was, this te was there a temptation by the video director or the producer or anything to sort of put you back into your Charlene outfits <laughs> and put the big hair and everything back on? I did have a, a conversation with the stylist initially, who's one of my best friends as well, and he was determined to get me in a red rara skirt and a big scrunch hairdo and I said William I love you but no we are not going there we can we can kind of go there but we don't really need to go to that very point so yeah it was discussed but we thought let's not do it <laughs> clever girl think you are but you think too much the second single was Did It Again, released on the 24th of November 1997 with the B-side Tears. Kylie promoted the single heavily on television in the UK, which led to it peaking at a respectable number 14 on the UK singles chart in December, where it remained there for another six weeks. In Australia, it peaked at number 15 and lasted 17 weeks in the top 50, one of her longest spanning singles on the chart. Petro Romani directed the accompanying music video shot in London in which Kylie portrays four different versions of herself. Sex Kylie, Cute Kylie, Indie Kylie and Dance Kylie. Did It Again is basically I'm telling myself off in this song and I have whereas some of the songs are, are from my heart or my gut or from my head. This one I really feel like it's, it's just a little voice on my shoulder and even when I recorded the song I think I was snarling at myself just thinking you fool you just had to go and you've done it again you know I mean I think a lot of people you say it to yourself time and time again I did it again why what, haven't you learnt yet to um to not do the things you do so uh, the few people I've spoken to about that song understood it as, as me talking to myself, which I was glad about because I thought it might sound like I'm telling someone else off, but actually I'm telling myself off. You better put that business to bear by your bare hands a sign you met with the monster in your mind. You did it again. Deconstruction planned to have the album out in January 1997, but postponed its release to May. Even with copies of the album already printed in mid-1997, it was delayed again to September. On the 31st of August 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident. Because of the impact of her death, Kylie and Deconstruction felt the album's title was inappropriate and delayed its release for three months. The album also missed the planned January 1998 release. Frustrated with the constant delays, Kylie came to an agreement with her label to retitle it Kylie Minogue in Europe and the UK. It is her third self-titled studio album, following her debut in 1988 and her 1994 album. Uh, what's the new album called? When, and when is it's, it out? Is um, it it's it called out? Kylie Minogue. <laughs> It's very inventively. Isn't that tremendous? Yeah. The meetings ah. that must have gone on. I know. 
thrash that one out. Well, it was to be called Impossible Princess, and we uh, we dropped that title yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah, timing was wrong. Um, so yeah, it comes out in January. I'll be very, very relieved when it comes out. It's been postponed and postponed. On the 22nd of October 1997, BMG released the album in the Japanese market, which included the bonus track Tears alongside the lenticular cover sleeve. The following month, Impossible Princess was produced in both CD and cassette formats in Russia and Poland. The standard edition of Impossible Princess was finally made available in Australia and New Zealand in early January 1998 and was issued in Europe and the UK in March that same year. Deconstruction cancelled plans to release Impossible Princess in North America following the sudden closure of her US distributor in late 1994. Upon its release, critical reception of Impossible Princess was sharply divided. The album was criticised by UK reviewers who did not appreciate her move into indie music and electronica, labelling the move as a trend-chasing attempt. Some reviewers, mostly from outside the UK, gave overwhelming praise to its production and Kylie's overall contribution. Despite reviews, Impossible Princess debuted and peaked at number 10 on the UK Albums Chart, making it the third highest debuting album of that week and Kylie's sixth top 10 entry. The album sold 20,000 copies in its first two weeks of release. In a similar run, the album charted at number 10 on the Scottish Albums Chart. Impossible Princess had sold 64,483 copies in the UK as of October 2020. The album experienced greater success on the Australian Albums Chart, where it debuted and peaked at number 4 on the 25th of January 1998. Breathe, Kylie's final single under deconstruction, was released on the 16th of March 1998 in radio edit form, which was slightly sped up from the album version, and also featured mixes from Sash and Todd Terry. Welsh film director Kieran Evans directed the accompanying music video. The single reached number 23 in Australia and inside the top 20 at number 14 in the UK. Just because I breathe. I wrote Breathe in Japan. I think at that time I felt very still and, and restrained and quiet, but actually there's a lot going on. And that's typical of me. Someone might say, what's wrong? You know, if a lot of people, if they're upset or, or, or angry or any of those things, will bring it out. But me, I keep it quiet. My girlfriend says to me, you, you don't realize how loud you are when you're quiet. When, when I'm silent, she says, the, the thunderclouds can just roll over. And I think it was a point like that where I keep saying I'm thinking, thinking about it all. And, and that's just that's just typical where, like, what's wrong? I'm thinking, I'm tr deciding what's wrong because I'm not clear about it in my head. And so by saying breathe, it won't be long now. It's just trying to stay calm until until I reason as to, as to what's going on in my head. Because of popular demand, Too Far was released on 12-inch vinyl in May 1998 as a promotional single. Two remixes were made for the single, a Brothers in Rhythm remix that contained new vocals and ad-libs from Kylie and a Europop remix by Junior Vasquez. Both remixes would appear on the remix album Mixes in support of Impossible Princess released in 1998. Too Far was planned to be the final single and to be released commercially, but these plans were later scrapped. Instead, Cowboy Style was released as the album's final single, with Love Takes Over Me on the B-side on the 5th of October 1998 and distributed only in Australia. It was not released in the UK because of Kylie's departure from deconstruction in November. Owing to a limited number of issued formats, the track only charted for a single week at number 39 on the Australian Regional Top 50. Cowboy Style. That I wrote early on in, in the making of the album and 
it's basically about meeting my boyfriend and the way that when you you start a fresh relationship with someone they can bring out so many different emotions in you and make you question yourself a bit more and when I met my boyfriend he had a, a very um, unusual look to say the least and so he reminded he, he made me think of a lot of different things it, kind of like the cowboy coming into town like like a, a bit like a monk a bit like this cyber creature so that's basically about um, him coming into my life in May 1998, Kylie confirmed the Intimate and Live concert tour, which began on the 2nd of June at the Palais Theatre in Melbourne, Australia that same year. Initially, she wanted to finish the tour in Melbourne on the 4th of July, but because of high demand in England, Kylie hosted three additional concert performances there. The tour attracted positive reviews from publications, praising the idea of a smaller venue show. She received compliments for her vocal performance and stage presence. Each concert had drawn in approximately 2,000 audience members in Australia and the media there deemed it a commercial success. To complete the tour's promotion, an accompanying live album and DVD shot at the Capitol Theatre Sydney were released. Kylie Minogue Possible Princess would receive nominations at the 1998 ARIA Music Awards show held in October for Best Pop Release, Best Female Musician and Album of the Year, her first nomination in this category. The music video for Did It Again won the 1998 International Viewers' Choice Award at the MTV Australia Awards show. Kylie Minogue, Impossible Princess, more Kylie, get some now. Because of pressure from the British press and public, Kylie contemplated retiring from the music industry for good. She decided instead to part with Deconstruction and BMG in November 1998. Kylie has noted that Impossible Princess was the most disappointing moment in her music career and commented that if she were to write another album of personal songs, it would be seen as Impossible Princess 2 and be equally critiqued. Retrospectively, the album has been regarded by music critics as Kylie's most personal and misunderstood work. Several critics noticed the sonic and lyrical similarities between the album and 1998's Ray of Light by Madonna. Media publications such as Flavor Wire and Slant Magazine listed the album as one of the most underrated pop albums. In May 2003, Impossible Princess was remastered as a double CD album. The release contained a bonus disc featuring remixes and three additional recordings, Love Takes Over Me, Tears and This Girl. The album reinstated the Impossible Princess title in Europe and the UK upon its re-release. Following the split with Deconstruction, Kylie took a break from recording music to focus on her acting career, including starring in the Australian films Cut and Sample People, the latter providing fans with a new Kylie song, The Real Thing, which was a cover of a Russell Morris track from the late 60s. Kylie gave several live performances in Australia, including the 1998 Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. She returned to the studio in 1999, collaborating with the Pet Shop Boys on a duet titled In Denial on their 1999 studio album Nightlife. Following In Denial, Parlophone, a British record label the Pet Shop Boys had been with since 1985, decided to sign Kylie in June 1999. 
in an early meeting with Parlophone to discuss which direction Kylie intended to pursue, the singer decided to return to her pop roots, saying, I should do what I do best. And the rest, as they say, is history. Thanks for watching. Thank you.